Right, well, to those of you who have just joined, welcome to the webinar, Designing Biofacial PV Projects in Brazil. So uh, today uh, we'll have uh, our expert, Alan Akamatsu, technical manager of uh, LATAM uh, from Longi, uh, you know, tell us how one of the, the keys to designing biofacial PV uh, projects. Um, so as I've told you a few uh, minutes ago, so we will send you the recording and the, the presentations. And also uh, I encourage you to send your questions through the Q&A box. We will actually, uh, you know, this custom once Alan has finished his uh, presentation. So, um, right, well, um, another thing, we encourage people to say where they're joining from. So I'm here with my colleague Araceli from Madrid, Spain. So, uh, well, without further delay, so um, over, over to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much for the invitation. And well, I guess good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am uh, uh, the technical manager for Latin America for Longi Solar. So I'll be talking a little bit about uh, our company Longi, a little bit about our technology, and then we'll get right to our subject, right? Designing bifacial systems in Brazil. So let me share my screen. Uh, so Carlos, could you tell me when you are able to see my presentation? I can see right now and it, it's perfect. So. All right. So I'll start talking a little, very briefly about Longi, right? Won't take too much time. So basically Longi uh, is a Chinese company. We were founded. Uh, 20 years ago now, right? So we started as actually a wafer production company and we had our uh, IPO in the Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2012. By 2014, that's when we actually bought a company called Larry Solar and that's where we officially entered the solar panel market. We finished 2019 with a uh, production capacity of 42 gigawatts in uh, monocrystalline wafers and 14 gigawatts in uh, uh, panel production, right? And the ingot and wafer production is actually 40% uh, of the total global capacity production. By 2020, right, by December this year, uh, we plan to more than double our production capacity, reaching 30 gigawatts of solar panels. So these are our production facilities, roughly uh, eight factories in China. There's two outside of China, one in Malaysia and one in Vietnam. Those are usually uh, reserved for more of the North American market, right? For Brazil and Latin. We usually uh, get all our production from the Chinese factories. So as mentioned before, this is our, the evolution of our production capacity in wafer and solar panels. So uh, Longi actually, uh, early this year, she, we've got uh, from uh, PV module tank bankability ratings, uh, the we were the first company to actually reach the AAA bankability ratings. So that means that uh, financially speaking, right, uh, Longi is a very solid, very, very robust company. And one of the pillars that enables this AAA uh, rating is actually uh, our R&D investment, right? So every year we spend from five to 7% on average uh, on R&D, which has awarded us over 700 patents and over 600 uh, collaborators working specifically in research and development. Right? And through that, all the innovations, uh, all the new uh, product that we can you know, uh, actually introduce to the market, all the new technology, uh, this is how we maintain all that, uh, you know, uh, tier one status, all our bankability ratings, all our robust financial uh, results. So 
Okay, one, cons one consequence of that. Uh, we are also one of the few companies who actually have uh, the uh, extended reliability reports from independent laboratories, RDTC and PVL. So talking a little bit about uh, our technology itself, right, uh, or panels. We have a few characteristics. First, Longi Solar only works with monocrystalline silicon, right, due to its higher degree of purity, its higher degree of standardization, it actually absorbs irradiance better. Every, uh, every lining Longi also is a perk uh, cell, right, which is a uh, chemical treatment that, also, that actually passivates the backside of the cell, and it basically increases the power bin and the efficiency. Uh, the third characteristic is our half-cut cells, uh, which basically consists of literally, it's literally cutting the cell in half, right, and assembling the panel with it. So this actually diminishes the electrical resistance uh, inside the panel, which in turn give us two very interesting things. The first is we actually are able to break down our operating temperature, right, so this will actually have a better result, a better performance. Once we uh, face a few, uh, a few problems, such as, you know, hotspots, this same uh, half-cut design also enables to have between 15 or 25 uh, Celsius, uh, 15 or 25 degrees uh, less temperature when you're facing hotspots. And the third characteristic is actually due to the uh, design itself from the uh, half-cut cell. You can clearly see that it's kind of mirrored, right, on the bottom and the top, if you look at the middle where the three bypass diodes are. So this type of electrical design actually can mitigate shading loss by up to 50%, partial shading loss, right? So all of our panels, they have all these three characteristics, right, once again. Uh, monocrystalline cells, per treatment, and half-cut cells. Oh, of our uh, records, right, reaching 500, the famous five milestone now that will be greatly talked about from the second semester on, the 500 watt panels and on, 500 and over, right? And the efficiency that, you know, has reached over 20% a while ago, but still is uh, still is a record. And uh, finally, talking uh, about the final characteristics uh, in our solar modules uh, or power degradation, right? We got a 12 year uh, product warranty and a 30 year performance warranty for our bifacial panels in which this is actually the lowest power degradation warranty in the market, right? We have a 2% power degradation in the first year and then a 0.45% degradation from the second till the 30th year. So in other terms, you know, once your uh, PV power plant celebrates his 30th birthday, you will still have almost an 85% power output from each panel. So, uh, so, getting to our main point in this webinar, let's talk a little bit about the bifacial technology, a little bit about the bifacial systems. So basically, when you get to a bifacial panel, we have a, another layer of silicon on the back side of the panel. The back sheet's no longer that white back sheet, it's a transparent, so it's a double glass. Uh, solar panel and it actually uh, is able to absorb the indirect irradiation or, or the indirect light from the backside, right? So talking uh, a little bit about two uh, concepts that we need to define when we talk about uh, bifacial technology, right? First is the bifacial factor and let's say for just for, you know, uh, for an example's sake, 
If you have a 70% bifacial factor in your solar panel, what does that mean? What is that concept? The concept is that uh, the backside of the panel uh, is able to generate 70% of the nominal power rating up to, right? If you are exposed to the same uh, scenario and irradiance conditions, right? So this is the first concept. Uh, the second concept is the bifacial gain. And the bifacial gain is simply the amount of extra energy generated, right? In megawatt hour, pretty simple. So when we talk about irradiance, right? Uh, bifacial gains, when we are designing a PV system, bifacial uh, system, we have to worry about five main parameters, right? So I'll list them here and I'll talk in further details about all, all these five parameters, right? First is the albedo, which is basically the uh, reflective index from the ground material, right? So your, your ground, it, it, it could be grass, it could be land, it could be sand, <clears throat> it could be snow, it could be concrete, and each material has a different uh, uh, reflective capability. So when the solar rays hit the ground and they are reflected back to the panel, right, to the backside of the panel, that, uh, you know, that phenom we call albedo. And it's a, you know, it's a value that ranges from zero to one. This is the first concept, right? The uh, height of your uh, PV cyst, right? How much, what is the ideal height that you should install your PV cyst? Uh, your racking, right? Your racking, this is, I guess, pretty clear, pretty uh, obvious. If you're generating uh, energy from the backside, all your structures, be, be it a rack or a tracker, it cannot create shading on the backside, right? So you also, you always have to install uh, by the frames, like ordering the frames, right? You cannot go through the panel. Row spacing, which is basically the distance between uh, different strings, or you know, the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> ground covering ratio. On a bifacial system, you have to have actually a uh, higher, uh, sorry, a lower GCR and a higher distance, a longer distance between panels. And I'll explain that in a while. And the fifth parameter, which is really important, is the DCAC ratio on the inverter. But uh, I will talk a little bit in further detail about these five parameters now. So starting on the albedo, right? So it's the capability of your ground material to reflect the sunlight. We have here uh, different examples of uh, what is the albedo value for different materials. But I just like to stress uh, a few things, right? So the lighter the material, lighter is lighter in color, right? The more it will reflect. However, once, once you start studying and doing simulations with your albedo, you always have to consider a range, right? For instance, uh, let's take grass. It's, uh, it actually ranges from, like, from 0 0.15 to 0 0.26, because, simply because the grass, uh, depending on the time of the year, it can be, it is like green and fresh, and that's when you have the highest albedo, but during fall it becomes brown and has a, a lower albedo, right? And that, that happens to some extent with every material. Right, so you always have to consider uh, a range or an interval when you have, you're doing your simulations for albedo. <clears throat> in, so let's look in practical terms, right? In Brazil, you will, uh, the most common material you will see will be a mix of land and grass, right? It's not necessarily dry sand. You, know, you will also have that in like the coastal line, but it's like compressed land. Right, so it, it, it gathers less dust. So it's compressed land and grass, right? This will be the, the two most common uh, materials in Brazil. 
And it, it, you will usually see a mix of those two in the same PV since plant, right? It's not 100% land and it's not 100% grass, it's a mix. But regardless of that, uh, well, you will hardly see snow in Brazil. So you can basically rule that out, right? <laughs> the 2.80 albedo. Um, and the albedo is the parameter that it's, it's a very sensitive parameter. Right? when you're dealing with the biofacial system, it will directly affect the amount of irradiance radiance that the backside of the panel will receive, and therefore the amount of extra energy or the bifacial gain that you will have as a result. So that was the first parameter, albedo. Second parameter, it's the system's height, right? Uh, what we have here is that if, uh, if you look at the two bottom uh, pictures, actually, that is the backside of the panel, right? So it's the backside of the panel at eight centimeters height and the backside of the panel at 1.08 meters. So what does this illustrate, right? If you, if you install your system, regardless if it's in a racking system or a tracking system, if you have your panel really, really low, right, the reflective irradiance, the indirect irradiance, it will not be able to reach the panel uh, fully, right? It will only reach the borders, right? So you will have half or less than half of your panel <coughs> actually absorbing the sunlight. So this will not be interesting to your, uh, to your, PV, uh, to your system. However, it, when you start to you know, get that panel and install it higher, like at least one meter, you will, see, you, will, you will gradually see a better performance, a better light absorption. When you reach one meter, that's where it becomes to, uh, it starts to become ideal, right? Because the backside of your panel will be wholly uh, exposed to the sunlight. So this is why when you're designing uh, biofacial systems, you have to, uh, try as much as you can to extend the height of your system, right? And one meter, that, that is uh, a, a good height to, to install your system. And when I say height, that is the lowest point uh, of your panel, right? So actually when you're using trackers, when you have either the maximum positive or negative angle, uh, Ideally, you should have it at least one meter off the ground. Uh, in some cases, you will not be able to, but once again, try to have the highest possible uh, installation as you can. So third, right, the backside shading. If you're using a rack system, so just you have to install it uh, by going around the frame and not going across the panel. And when you're using uh, trackers, be it the vertical 1P or the vertical 2P, uh, there are two things that will actually impact shading. One is uh, the axis of the tracker, right? The axis diameter. So uh, you know, the smaller the diameter, the less it will impact, but you don't have too much control on that because the axis actually have to work with a, a safety coefficient, right? So your, so your panels don't fall down, so your tracker doesn't break or, you know, uh, your panel doesn't bend and things like that. So you don't have, have too much control over it, right? However, what you do have uh, a relative higher degree of control is the distance between this axis, the tracker axis, and the backside of the panel, right? And what we, uh, what we actually suggest is that you have at least uh, 40 millimeters, which is four centimeters of space between the axis and the backside of your panel. Most tracker companies can do that comfortably, right? They can actually achieve uh, <laughs> much more than 40 millimeters it's usually between like eight, uh, 80 and 120, right? So eight centimeters and 12 centimeters. So you should not have any problems when designing your PVC, right? Just make sure it's, it's above four centimeters, but you know, 
most tier one tracker companies can very comfortably go over that. And yes, so uh, the longer that distance is, the better. So for the fourth uh, parameter, right, row spacing, as we mentioned, when you when you are designing a, a bifacial system, you actually have to pay attention to a few things. Uh, one is you have to actually have a, a longer distance between your strings, right? So there are uh, two reasons for that. The first reason is usually, depending on the project philosophy, when you're doing a monofacial system you actually accept a very small per percentage of power loss due to uh, the zenith angle. What, right, so, and what the zenith angle is, it's actually the angle that the uh, solar ray will hit your panel and it will vary a little bit uh, during the year, right? So here in Brazil, when you reach actually the winter time, you will, uh, your zenith angle will be uh, a bit more pronounced, a bit higher, and so you will create more shading. Uh, in some projects, in some designs, monofacial designs, it's okay to, uh, for you know, a few reasons for the restrictions you might have in your project, the land restrictions, uh, or things like that, you can actually accept a very, very small percentage of power loss due to it, right? But when you're designing a bifacial system, you cannot have that power loss from the zenith angle. You have to you know, bring it down to zero. So how do you do that? You actually extend the distance between the strings. So this is one thing you must do. The second reason why you must extend the row spacing is because when you do so, you will have more of a ground area available for the solar rays to hit the ground, be reflected, back to the back side of the panel, right? So if you actually have more lead exposed to the sunlight, you will have more reflective, reflected irradiance, and therefore you will achieve a better uh, bifacial gain. Okay. So the fifth and uh, final parameter by no, but you know, by no means is the least important is actually your DC AC ratio on your inverter. A very common parameter is using a 1.2 DC AC ratio. Uh, but when you have a bifacial system, since you are generating more energy uh, throughout the day, right, in, out, in all hours of the day, uh, your generation curve will actually be wider and higher. So you actually have to uh, bring your DC AC ratio down a little bit. So you do not suffer from more uh, clipping loss. So how do you do that? So let's take, for instance, the 1.2 DCAC ratio, right? You have a monofacial system with 1.2. Then you're going to design a bifacial system, right? You will not ideally use the 1.2. You will actually have to calculate your bifacial gain. And for you know, example's sake, let's say it's you have a 10% bifacial gain. In other words, you're generating 10% more energy. Uh, what do you do? You have to actually uh, diminish your DCAC ratio by 10%. So instead of 1.2, you actually use something around 1.1. Okay, so this is in order for you to not lose more power due to the inverter clipping. So, Basically, those are the uh, five parameters that you will have to use when designing bifacial systems. And uh, I guess we will go to the questions, right? The Q and A very soon, so you guys can actually make <laughs> a lot of inquiries about you know what are the common parameters in Brazil, how to do it. But I just like to show you a couple of examples, right? couple of case studies to illustrate in practical terms uh, how a bifacial system behaves, right? So in this example, you have a bifacial system. It is a, in a single axis tracker. The albedo is gravel, right? Rocks and stones, but not white gravel. It's beige, 
right? So there's a big difference <laughs> with beige gravel. Uh, the albedo is around 20%, which is more or less close to what we will also find in grass, right? So when you actually uh, use that, we can see that we have an 8% uh, bifacial gain. Right? And this project, once again, it has a very high um, angle uh, speed, right? You can see it's very tilted and it, it doesn't reach the one meter above the ground, which, you know, there are uh, restrictions. Not every project will be able to reach that, which is, you know, it's fine. You cannot, yeah, it's very hard to get a 100% optimized project, right? So as long as you do, uh, you do actually design the best you can with all of your restrictions in place, you should be fine. Right? So in this case, we got an 8% bifacial gain for a bifacial system using a, a tracker, one axis tracker, and with an albedo of around 0.2 or 20%. And oh, just to you know, let you know, this was conducted by independent third party lab. But you can also, you know, use bifacial, you can also design bifacial systems uh, on racks. It doesn't necessarily have to do on trackers. So in this example, you can see that uh, you can use it either on portrait or landscape. It is at one at a one meter height. And now this time we are using a different albedo surface. It's the white gravel. So you can see it has a higher albedo. The, grab, the beige gravel has around 20%, the white gravel around 35%, right? So with that albedo, you can actually see that the, uh, uh, the bifacial gain is higher, right? Jump from 8% to 10.9%. Of course, uh, once again, it's not just the albedo that factors in. As we mentioned, there are five main parameters that factors in when you're designing your bifacial system. In other words, you have to make a few adjustments, right? Adapt your system to what you're usually doing when compared to the monofacial systems. So, so far, uh, Laundry has had uh, over five gigawatts of bifacial projects around the world. A world. A quick survey conducted by Bloomberg asked, you know, the PV market, what did they think about the bifacial technology? And we all, we actually had like a over 80% acceptance ratio, which, you know, uh, really shows that the bifacial technology, though new, right? And I think it's the uh, evolution of the PV market, especially for the centralized generation projects. So thank you very much. And uh, we will be taking questions now. Thank you very much, Alan, for your presentation. So we have quite a lot of questions. So if you could stop sharing your screen. Of course, then yeah. <laughs> they'll see us, right. Um, so, um, well, we have, um, you know, quite a lot of questions here. So let's go through them. Um, we have um, a question on whether where you could get albedo uh, data, how it is measured. Um, could you like give us a, an overview on that? Sure. So uh, there's actually some lab measurements uh, from different companies, but Logic can provide this table for you for the average albedo value for every material, right? But it's basically how it is conducted and studied. You, you get every different material and you do uh, actually a spectrum study on how the light will reflect off that material. And that's how we uh, get from the zero to 100% uh, values. Of course, you know, just like the uh, absolute zero, the perfect reflectance is only theoretical, right? And it's snow, which is the most reflective panel. It is not one, it's around 80%, right? So be aware of that. That in theory, it goes from zero to 100%, but there's no actual material that will have a reflection. That will give you 100%. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Okay. And um, someone asked 
um, whether um, how you should whether cotton grass I think affects the level of albedo albedo um, so yeah so how does grass cotton affect albedo is there an optimum grass height so I think so by looking at, at your table that what you show mm -hmm. well grass is probably not the like the, the best uh, surface for albedo yeah, it's, it's not very high, right? So it ranges from 0 0.15 to 0 0.26. However, it is the most common material in most projects, right? Especially in Brazil. So this will actually be uh, the most common ground material you will find. A mix of grass and, you know, land, compressed land, not sand, right? right. Um, so it actually... Uh, the optimum uh, grass height is actually the height in which you should keep your O&M plan, right? Your operation and maintenance. Do not let your grass grow too big uh, that it will actually create shading on your PV right? right? So, so this this is the optimum height, right? Keep your O&M uh, in in good quality, right? You can cut your grass, right? There's no problem, but don't let it get so high that it, it will create shading on your system okay okay no that's uh those are some uh some tips there for you who, who asked you know how to uh, treat the ground for albedo and there are also uh, questions about clearance so you spoke about clearance and there are right. a few questions uh about mm -hmm. one of them was whether they should be clearance should be higher than in normal panels um how high they should be uh, raised and whether this affects the cost of foundation. So is it, is it more expensive to have uh, higher foundations, that the higher foundations you need if you use uh, uh, bifacial modules? Right, so uh, when you're using trackers, no, right, it's already standardized what the tracker heights are. So you wouldn't have any uh, any cost variance in that. When you're using racks, then in the, in the amount of structure that you need for a higher installation will be more. So you you might incur in a slightly higher uh, uh, material cost. However, this will be compensated by the extra energy generation, right? So when you're doing, uh, when you're developing a PV project, Right. What are the four main pillars? It's the technical pillar, number one, which basically is uh, trying to get as much uh, energy generation as possible while mitigating the power loss. Right. This is the technical side of it. The second one is the capex, right, which is just the, the amount of the investment. The third one is the LCOE or the energy cost. Right? And when you're actually using bifacial systems, uh, you, you have to ponder a lot more uh, what the LCOE is, not only the capex, right, right? the amount of investment, uh, because you're actually now generating more energy with the same system than you're doing with monofacial. So in case you incur into a slight uh, capex increase, uh, you're, you have to look at how much uh, extra energy you're generating. Right? And this will actually make your your LCOE better, right? Your LCOE lower, so the cost of energy that will actually be lower, and your project therefore will have a better financing performance. So, but it, yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I answered half of the question, right? The the, the, the no, first I think, half. Of... <laughs> sorry, I think it's my fault for bundling in, you know, four or five questions. But I think you answer the questions. So the questions were. Okay. Uh, should they be raised higher? So I think you, uh, yes. you answer that, that normal. Yes, you must. <laughs> and uh, whether it would uh, cost more, and you mentioned, well, not that much more, and you also get more electricity, like more electrical output, so could uh, it, it should compensate. So um, I think you, you did answer all of the questions that I asked not very clearly just now. There is uh, <laughs> one of a. Um, there is someone is asking what do you mean by the by facial factor? If you could explain again, because I right. wasn't so, clear to some. So 
some people. It's believe. either called uh, bifacial factor or bifaciality. Maybe you know, you, know, mm-hmm. you might be a little bit more familiar with that term. So <clears throat> let's take uh, an average market value, right? The panels you will find will have an average of a 70% bifaciality or 70% bifacial factor. It's the exact same thing, right? And what what the concept behind that is, is the ability of the backside of your panel to uh, generate power when compared to the front side. So every time we talk about the uh, power rating or the power bin of a panel, it is exclusively the front side, right? So a 440 watt peak panel, it's 440 front side. And what the bifaciality or the bifacial factor states when it's 70% is that in, if you expose the backside of your panel to the exact same scenario and to ex- the exact same variables as the front side, it will generate up to 70% of the front side power rating. Right? So that is the, the concept of bifacial factor. So um, in best, so in the, an optimum scenario, we generate up to seventy percent of the of what the the front uh, side of a of a panel would generate. Yeah, that is the concept, but uh, very clearly, uh, this is a, a theoretical concept for two things. You will never turn your <laughs> you will never turn your panel right inside mm-hmm. out. <laughs> So you will use the backside to get the direct sunlight. Mm. You will never do that, right? So you'll never reach the 70% power, but that is the concept. Okay. And um, what's the um, extra generation you could get from generating on both sides of the panel on a more normal circumstance? Yeah. So uh, if you actually optimize technically your... uh, your PV system, your sorry, your PV system, uh, you can actually come up to twenty-five or thirty uh, percent bifacial gain. However, uh, it's very uh, it's very hard to optimize your entire system completely, right? As spoken before, you have every every company has a certain amount of resources and also a certain amount of restrictions in their project, right? It's not always one hundred percent. So what you have to do is get the optimum design uh, with what you can do, or in other words, you will always have your own uh, project philosophy or you know, philosophy design. And with that, what we're going to see uh, in the first uh, bifacial projects in Brazil is that you, people will usually uh, use uh, the ground material that it's available in their, in their plant. Right. This will be the most common cases. Yes, some people might actually start treating the ground material, the land, right, to get better albedo. But for the first projects that will uh, start operation, that will come into operation in Brazil, uh, you, the companies will actually opt to keep the common albedo. In Brazil, it will most likely be grass and compressed land, right? In some other countries, it might be sand, right? Uh, in very, very cold climates, you might have snow for three or six months, right? So for the first, uh, for this first batch of bifacial systems, we'll see uh, the plant operating with their natural ground material, right? So in that, you will have somewhere between five and 10% bifacial gain. Okay. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Someone from the audience asked whether it makes economic sense to engage in surface modification for albedo maximization. Um, have you done some studies on this? Yes. Under which yes. circumstances, you know, is it um, is it justified to uh, so, treat the ground so you get <coughs> higher reflectance from the ground? Yeah. So once again, we fall to that project philosophy, right? Or, you know, uh, project development. Uh, The albedo, once you keep all the other variables the same and you only change the albedo, 
the uh, wine facial gain is almost linear, right? So if you if you have a, a albedo of 20% and you actually change it to like 40 or 45%, you will see uh, a, an almost one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, right? Which means uh, you will almost double your bifacial gain if you keep all the other variables the same in your project, right? So this is the actually the, so this is the math or the calculation you have to do uh, when you're designing your project. Take a look at the four pillars. Take a look at the technical side, the capex, the LCOE, and actually I think I forgot to tell what the fourth pillar is: is the return on investment, right? So you you take a look at that, right? And you you will have to do uh, you have to study many scenarios to find what the optimum. Uh, project is or the optimum case for your company is, right? But yes, if you change the albedo, the uh, ratio which you will change it is almost one to one. So you double the albedo, you will uh, practically double your bifacial gain. And from mm -hmm. that start point, you go again to your project and you look at it, uh, how it will be, what will be the best end result for it. Okay. Brilliant. So um, there is another person who is asking um, a question about the operating temperatures of uh, monoperg versus bifacial. So are there any significant differences or are they quite similar in that regard? It's, it's quite similar for the operating temperature for monofacial and bifacial. It's practically the same. So, no. Okay. And um, Someone is asking, how do you uh, minimize hotspots on, on the back side of the module? Um, does the structure have an influence on this? So yes, right? So when you're dealing on the back side, you have to uh, cut the shadings to zero. So uh, every time you're installing your panel, be it a rack or a tracker, you cannot have any structures going to the middle of the panel. You, all, you always have to install it uh, by the frames, right? Mm -hmm. Doing a contour of it. And uh, we spoke a little bit about that, but about the shade impact on the tracker, right? Stating what are, what is the optimal distance between the tracker axis and the backside of the panel, which it's at least four centimeters or 40 millimeters. But, you know, most companies can do a lot more than that, between like eight and uh, eight centimeters and twelve centimeters. Most tracker companies, right? So yes, you do have to uh, be careful uh, to pay a lot of attention in shading impact and partial shading impact. Of course, you know dirt comes into play also because that will affect the panel depending on the amount of dirt that <laughs> that uh, your O and M plan uh, actually. Uh, you know, accepts, uh, you might generate some hotspots, but you also have to, you know, keep your ONN uh, up to date, right? Do not let it get dirty, uh, very like dusty and things like that. Because yeah, that will impact the PV assist any, anyway, right? anyhow. So that's a good point, actually. So regarding the operations and maintenance of a planned are there any different from a standard plan? So how often do you need to clean the rear side is one of the questions that I've, uh, I've got here. Yeah, so uh, actually the o &M is almost the same. You just have to clean the backside uh, on average once a year, right? Of course, it depends where your site is specifically, right? If you're actually in the desert, you might have to clean it more than once a year, right? right. <laughs> Right, but in like normal circumstances, right? I wouldn't say normal, on average circumstances. Uh, once again, let's take the example in Brazil, right? You have compressed land and grass. Cleaning the backside once a year is fine. So you actually have to do a more of a manual labor, right? On the front side, you have many options, many types of machines to do it, but on the backside, it's a little bit harder, right? So will be somewhat of more manual labor to do it on the backside. But once a year is fine. Once a year, on the, the most common circumstances. Yeah, talking uh, exclusively on the backside, right? The front side, just keep it as you will. Right. Um, 
Right. So we have um, we have a number. We have a question here about optimum tilt. So we, we've talked about the height. So is there a not a, a, an optimum uh, tilt that you where you could uh, maximize uh, by facial gain? Right. So so yes, there are two scenarios, right? When you're using racks, uh, the optimum tilt, it's basically the same as your latitude. So if you're at minus 20 latitude, you, your tilt, your optimum tilt will actually be 20, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is in practical terms, it's not always achievable. You will most of the times get like 10, 12 tilt, which is fine, right? 10 or 12 is better than zero when using racks. But when you're using a bifacial system, you will you have to tilt a little bit more, right? So if you actually want to have a better bifacial gain, you have to tilt two or three degrees more than you would on a, on a monofacial system. That is when you're using racks, not trackers, right? So that's, that's one case, one scenario. When you're actually using trackers, right? Uh, usually you're using a seagull axis tracker, so you do not have a say on the tilt, right? You have the angles that go from east to west, right? But you do not have a tilt on the seagull axis tracker. So your tilt for the tracker is zero, but you know, the energy generation is compensated from that movement following east to west. And uh, so on trackers, you, unless you're using a tilted tracker or a two axis tracker, uh, there's no way to talk about tilt, but that doesn't mean that the tracker will not give you further energy generation. It will. Right. Right. Okay. Well, a few things to consider there. Um, another design question uh, that I can see here on the list has to do with the space between the the rows. Are there any um, general recommendations other than well? designed to avoid shading, right? Which is pretty standard, but. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there is some average numbers, right? Uh, when you're using the bifacial systems in Brazil, we usually start doing simulations with a distance of around eight meters. And we actually start, you know, increasing the distance from that which will actually change the energy generation. So you start doing your scenario evaluation from there, right? So, but basically if you're, if you're not in Brazil and you're doing your simulations, you get the distance as you would from your monofacial system. So for just for example, say, let's say you use six meters for your system on a monofacial system. Take that six meters and start uh, enlarging it until you do not have uh, uh, a shading loss due to the zenith angle, which in the southern hemisphere is when you're in winter, the zenith angle will increase and will, you will have more shading on your plant. So take that down to zero and you start, then that is the uh, start point. Right. That distance is your start point. You cannot, you cannot accept any uh, shading loss due to a variance in the zenith angle. So start from there. Get your monofacial system. See when, what, in what distance you will no longer have any loss due to shading during winter in the southern hemisphere. And you will start to play from there. So that is your x zero right your starting point from distance and you can actually uh, increase that distance to see uh how much more energy gain you will go you will have by facial gain values right and uh, finally i can see this question on the box like four or five times i think it's a, a million dollar question so what's the the price difference between a monofacial module and a bifacial module I'm sorry, what is the, the, the price difference? difference? Price, yeah. Uh, percentage. Uh, <laughs> percentage wise. Uh, I would have to bring my colleagues from the commercial team, right? <laughs> right? To talk a little bit about that. 
but um, it's 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 practically non-existence, right? It's very very small. And as soon as you got uh, scalability in the market, we will see uh, more and more bifacial systems being connected to the grid. Uh, you know that difference will uh, diminish more and more. But it's very very small, right? I can put you in contact with my commercial team if you'd like to, you know, get a quote or discuss about a little bit more about right, pricing. Right, so, I mean, what I would say is that, you know, to those interested in, in this type of question, which is more, I can see someone asking the price, someone asking whether you have an office in their particular country. So um, we will actually send you uh, the details of uh, an email with uh, the presentations mm -hmm. that, you can either get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with um, Alan's team or you can get in touch with Alan directly and then he, he will put you in touch with the right people within uh, Nongi. But um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, all of these questions have answers. So. Uh, right. <laughs> of course. So, um, well, I think that, you know, we've uh, answered quite a lot of questions and, uh, we probably should start wrapping things up. So I'd like to thank everyone in the audience who's been uh, here with us for the, the last uh, hour and uh, to you, Alan. Um, are there any general uh, recommendations uh, or any parting words for, for the audience? Yeah, yeah, so of course. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, Thank you very much, ATA, for the opportunity of being here, you know, uh, participating in this webinar. And also, I'd just like to send a final message to the audience. Uh, please take care of your health. Please stay safe. Uh, so we're going through a very tough time regarding the pandemic. So uh, do as much as you can to protect yourself. And uh, I guess slowly but surely, uh, we will retake or restart our activities and you know get to get back to uh some semblance of normalcy that's right so um well we've actually um it's looking more and more normal here in spain now we were on base oh, hopefully fingers crossed you know we'll uh, uh yeah we'll get to that point uh, soon all over the world and things will keep uh, getting better here as well um, any case, you know, I'd like to echo um, Alan's message. So keep safe and uh, thank you very much for um, tuning in to our webinars. So if you want to know what other webinars do we have in store for you, you can go to our website, apainsights.com. And um, thank you, Alan, once again, and thank you to everyone in the audience. So, well, uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.